The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Right, and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. And uh, we're at the end of February, which means March Madness is already has already begun, basically. Um, we're getting yeah, closer. three buzzer beaters last night. Yeah. One of them from half court. College basketball has gotten insane the last couple of weeks. There's been upsets all over the place. Um, so in, what is it, two, two, three weeks? It's I think it's three weeks total. Because yeah. March Madness is technically at the end of the month, um, but we're looking at, I believe it's March 20th, is going to be our March Madness special. I don't know exactly um, who's going to be here, but it's at least going to be us, and I believe Sammy should be back. Um, and then depending on the time, my brother might be here, um, and we'll we'll see, and we'll go from there. Really want to pick Sammy's brain about Michigan State, and we'll get, we'll get into Michigan State. But, um, yeah, lots of crazy stuff going on with college basketball. Um, and that's going to be kind of the bread and butter of today's topics. But uh, we do want to give some NBA updates. We haven't talked about the NBA or the Pistons. Wow, that we can actually talk about the Pistons a little bit. Um, Pistons have been in a lot of games recently. Um, they got hosed by the refs against the Knicks the other a couple nights ago. Uh, they lost it, a crazy buzzer beater to the Magic, and then they finally got a win over Chicago last night, even though they were down at halftime, something like that. Yeah, I think so. Um, but they had a pretty solid game from Cade, and they no longer look like they're going to be in the running for worst NBA record of all time. They only need one more win now. They may not even be the worst team in the league by the end of the season. Yeah, I think something people have forgotten about, myself included, is that the Washington Wizards have the exact same record as the Pistons now. And, yeah. and they've, they've been the worst team yeah. in 2024. Yeah. They're 0-10 in their last 10, and it looks like there's not much hope in sight. They benched Jordan Poole. Yeah. If people didn't realize, mm-hmm. things got that bad the guy that they paid a lot of money to get this offseason yeah i didn't think it would go that sour that quick i don't think anybody saw it going that bad yeah um they also tried playing johnny davis a couple times and it's oh awful have you seen what happened to his jump shot yeah oh, oh. <laughs> i whoever their shooting coach is get rid of him yeah because he had a solid looking jumper coming out of wisconsin and now he has a hitch where he like brings it from his shot off oh. Mm. It, it's sad to see. It's yeah. like Michael Kidd Gilchrist X. Oh gosh. Ask. <laughs> I yeah, I only saw like some of his lowlights. Um but anyway, like we said, we'll do a full like we're gonna do a Pistons episode this offseason. I've already told Chris we gotta do it. Um but where are the Pistons at right now for you? Like, do you have hope? I'm still I'm still a little nervous. I'm keeping yeah. Some of that hope off. Right? I'm I'm not full back on the like crazy bandwagon of where I was to begin the season, mm-hmm. which I still think 30 wins wasn't like out of the norm or anything crazy. Like the young talent improving and a proven coach in Monty Williams and everything and everybody being healthy, it made sense that they would hit at least 30 wins to me. Mm-hmm. But nobody could have uh, scripted that. Marty Williams is going to have one of the worst coaching seasons in NBA history. Yeah. Where it literally looks like he's trying to sabotage the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have multiple players that were either put on the bench to start the season and lost confidence or guys that got hurt and didn't play. Yeah. And because of that, chemistry just hasn't come together until like recently. Guys are just now getting their confidence back. Killian Hayes is off the team. Yep. Once again, Killian Hayes is off the team. I hope he succeeds somebody somewhere else, but goodbye. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Isaiah Livers didn't work out. Mm-hmm. He had to go. 
Um, and in came Simone Fontecchio, yep. who's averaging like 13 or 14 since he got on the team. He's we also, playing well. We also finally dropped uh, Marvin Bagley. Yeah, dropped Marvin Bagley. Brought in Quentin Grimes and Malachi Flynn from the Knicks, mm -hmm. who have both looked good in their minimal time so far. Things look slightly positive. Yeah. For the for a small stretch for the first time in a long time, probably since the beginning of the season mm -hmm. when they started 2-1. and one. Yeah. And we all thought they were going to be the fun Pistons. Mm -hmm. And then dark clouds hit everywhere. Yeah. 28 game <laughs> lost year yeah. later. But yeah, now they're they're 3 and 7 in their last 10. Uh Cade Cunningham is playing with a vengeance. He looks annoyed and angry when he's out there. He wants to win every game. He scored over 30 against Orlando and against New York. He had 26 against Chicago. He was the leading scorer for the Pistons. Jalen Dern is still a double-double machine. Mm -hmm. Asar Thompson is playing better. He's been hitting one or two threes every game the past week and a half. Yep. And Jaden Ivey has confidence. Who would have known? Yeah. If you play him <laughs> as you should, good things happen. And un unfortunately, Marcus Sasser is out with a little bit of an injury right now. But mm -hmm. we've seen when you play him. He's been super He was efficient. better than Killian Hayes from the beginning of the season. He yeah. can confidently score and play defense. Mm -hmm. So you have at least eight guys right now that you can play and mix and match. Those bench units that Monty Williams throws out make no sense. He still doesn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Talking about Monty Williams, we'll save that for the summer thing yeah. because it's absolutely insane what's happened with him. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you mix and match certain lineups, and you play uh, like Quentin Grimes and Malachi Flynn with some starters. They play decent enough. They're competitive. Yeah. They play competitive basketball. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all we can ask for right now. Right. That they don't look like a joke like yeah. they did for a good portion of the season. Mm -hmm. In 2024 so far, they don't look like a complete joke. Yeah. And that's an improvement. Do you... Mm, trying to think how I want to phrase this. But do you think that this team... Like, do they need – how much more do they need to get to that next level? And th at this point, that next level is thirty waiting for a play-in? 30 wins was the next level to me, and that still is the next level for this yeah. team. But what they need – Like, what do they need to get there? I think they, they need another guy that is like a reliable shooter slash scorer. They need another guy since Boyan is gone now to the Knicks. Mm -hmm. Although, who knows, somebody could step up. Cade is getting better. But I, I think they need another guy, like a, a veteran, that mm -hmm. can come in and give them consistent production. This version of Monty Williams can go. It, it seems like after that Knicks loss, he found some type of – it's the first time he's shown signs of life mm -hmm. this entire season when he went on that rant after the Knicks loss saying it was one of the worst calls of the season, Yeah, which it was. It looked like Dante DiVincenzo basically tackled Asar Thompson mm -hmm. at the half court line, and the Knicks—I mean, and the refs just let it go. But yeah, this, I don't—I don't know what you get out of my, this version of Monty Williams. You might need to find somebody else, and they paid him all that money. It's—it's it's been a failure, and I—I I just don't believe in the front office right now. Yeah, even though they've made these little moves like Quentin Grimes and Malachi Flynn and getting rid of Killian. They've done things that they should have done a while ago. Mm -hmm. Killian should have never been a focal point. It, it It's just so many question marks that have only gotten like little half answers. Right. There have been no full answers to any question mm -hmm. of this team. Yeah. And when like a lot of people said like we could have gotten first round pick, at least one first round pick for Bojan last year. We passed up on it. Now we got basically nothing. Um, Quentin Grimes has been a surprise. I think defensively, I guess I thought I mean, was he, he. Every I think most Pistons fans figured he would be probably yeah. the best player out of the deal because right. he showed a lot of promise with the Knicks mm -hmm. this year. But he's a much better defender than than I think I ever really noticed. Yeah, he, um, he's your prototype or, three and D two guard. Mm -hmm. uh, you forget that him and Marcus Sasser actually played together in yeah. Houston, which is funny. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. Even so, my biggest thing is I think they just they need a solid four. They've been lacking that for a while. 
Preferably a guy that can shoot. People are trying to ride beef stew forever. Same way they kind of fell in love with Andre Drummond, in my opinion. I was feeling the same thing with Isaiah Stewart. Like, I just don't think he's the guy. I think people finally realize that. Um, I I rode for him for a while. Yeah. I liked him for, you know, what he provided. But at the same time, I knew he wouldn't. He's not the guy to get us over the hump. Yeah. Um, So I know we need a four. Need to clean the front office which is terrible at this time um, when you're trying to get a young core getting going to have to reset the the front office again. Um, and yeah, I don't know, even if, you know, they get a top draft pick this year, which they're, I mean, they're going to, but I don't know if any of those guys are going to change this team immediately. And I don't see any like free agents that we could sign that would uh, change the trajectory of this team. Like, I don't know. I'm I'm scared that we're stuck. And I don't know what it's going to take to get over that. Because to me, I don't I don't know if Cade can push any further than where he's at right now, which isn't a problem. But that means that somebody else has to be able to break through, whether it's Jaden Ivey, Jalen Duran, I also don't know like how much further can his game go necessarily? I don't know. Um, So to me, it ends up being Jaden. And if, and there's a small chance that Jaden and Cade, they can play together, but they're not, they're not a perfect fit in the backcourt, I guess. Um, And if they're not a perfect fit, then their two play styles might clash a little bit. And that could be problematic going forward. Now I'm hoping for the best. I like both of them. I like that they play a little differently. Um, but that just makes me nervous about this team. And I don't know exactly where that breakthrough is going to come from. And that's that's my biggest concern right now. Is yes, there's some promise, but who's going to break through? And then I guess you could say Asar too. Maybe there's a chance that he could break through, but I think that the most that he could really be is going to be like a 3 and D kind of guy if you can keep improving that jump shot. Is is that enough? I I don't know. That that's my biggest problem with this team. Like there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts. And I don't know. It's just it's just tough. I actually I think a high ceiling for us are, which in today's game might not seem the most valuable to somebody, but it is when you look at like winning situations. He could be Andre Karolenko. Mm-hmm. He could I be a guy that. that plays like super high level defense is a high level athlete mm-hmm. and hits about like 35, 36% of his threes mm-hmm. only takes like two or three a game. Yeah. That helps. That mm-hmm. is a winning player. Right. He could be 10 to 15 a night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's tricky. And again, I, I really want to pick Chris's brain about it uh, in the off season, but right now, I mean, there's hope. There's hope the the team looks better. There's at least some bright spots again. You can see the development a little bit. But I agree with you. I think I think the front office is kind of the the scariest part right now. And that's that's a big problem at the end of the day. All right. Let's do some NBA updates since we haven't talked about the NBA in a little bit. Cleveland Cavaliers, they're kind of the talk of the town right now, especially last night. Uh Max Struess hit five threes in the last seven minutes, including a half court shot. Beyond half court. Yeah. Game winner. Talk about a heater. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Um, so the Cavs have kind of been moving up in the East, and they're now all the way up into second. Uh, with it no is one. funny, though, because of Boston's – how their separation is hilarious yeah, right now. Yeah, Boston is kind of on their own tier right now. They're 27-3 and three at home, which is insane. Yeah. They're 46-12. and 12. Yeah. Uh, so Boston's number one. The, right now they're kind of the untouchable in the league right now. And then you got Cleveland, Milwaukee. New York has slid a little bit, but they've had some injury issues. Um, Miami has come back into the frame. They're sitting at fifth. And then Philadelphia is at sixth. They're not playing well without Embiid. Yeah. They're they're just not the same team. Right, which I think everybody kind of figured. And then you have your 7-8 seed, Orlando and Indiana. And then the two playing teams, Chicago and Atlanta. Um, Brooklyn and Toronto still have a chance. But uh, Brooklyn is like the most 
unappealing team to me. Yeah. In terms of teams that are just like stuck in the middle mm-hmm. and have good players, but you just get nothing when you watch them. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their big signing of Cam Johnson in the offseason, uh, it's been subpar to yeah. say the least, which is what a lot of people were scared to, to pay him that kind of money for. Um, and then Cam Thomas, you know, he's been really good for them, but he hasn't been as crazy efficient as he started off for the most part. Um, and then other than that, it's like Mikhail Bridges, and then they got a lot of decent guys beyond that. Um, and then Sh- Charlotte, Washington, and Detroit, they're they are all <laughs> they're out of it. Don't, yeah. don't worry about them. Um, any teams in the East that you want wanted to highlight? I think it's about time Atlanta seriously starts uh, to think about trading Trey. Hmm. They uh, they just keep playing this game where they think – I don't know if they really think Trey Young is just going to, like, pull off another magical run, but the way they keep constructing these teams, they have to know there's no way. Mm-hmm. They they can't, like, sustain this and think it's going to be successful. Right. And you brought in Quinn Snyder, and it's really not helping that much. It seems like him and uh, DeJounte Murray don't really fit. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether you trade DeJounte or Trey, but I think one of them have to go. Yeah, they were rumored to trade DeJounte at this trade deadline, and then they decided not to. It seems like like they both play well together. It's just something about this team that just does not does not work. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I've heard a ton of rumors of Trey potentially going to San Antonio. And him and Victor together, that would just be an absolute yeah. nightmare mm-hmm. that I'd like to see. Yeah. But who knows if it's actually going to happen. Right. Uh, I, I think I think Atlanta runs into a problem that, you know, some other teams run into where they just don't have the depth necessarily to compete. And, like, if Trey doesn't have a good game or DeJounte, it's like Bogdan Bogdanovich has not been that great. They've gotten good – uh games out of Jalen Johnson this year. Yeah. But then, like, DeAndre Hunter, Sadiq Bey. Clint Capella isn't the, it doesn't feel, seem like the same guy he was a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. I guess DeAndre Hunter's been pretty pretty, pretty consistent lately. I know Sadiq Bey has been kind of in and out. Capella, like you said, yeah, he's not necessarily what he was. I feel like Okongwu still hasn't, like. They need to pick. Broken through. Do they want him to start? Yeah, I don't know. Like, he was a lottery pick. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what they want to do with him. Right. And he's it's his fourth year? Like, he's already been in the league a few years. I think it's his third. Let me uh, try to double check. No, this is his fourth year. Wow, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he didn't play. Well, he played a decent amount in the first two years. But, yeah, he's he's only started in 36 total career games. Yeah, that, that's another thing. That, I, they're so in between on so many things. Mm-hmm. I, I, nobody knows what they actually want. Yeah, they finally traded away John Collins, which was supposedly their problem for a while. Uh, they're they're just kind of in a weird spot, I guess. And they've had a lot of like decent draft picks. They picked. They got Kobe Bufkin. They took AJ Griffin. Uh, they got Seth Lundy late. Um, like, they, yeah, they just. I don't feel like they're developing enough or. They're they're another weird team, to be honest. Because I always thought that they would they would be better than that what they are. Um team I wanted to point out is Indiana still. Like they had a lot of hype uh for the most part recently with the way Tyrese Halberton has been playing, but they've still been okay. They haven't fully broken through, I don't think. They are thirty three and twenty six. They're at the eighth seed. I haven't heard anything about Pascal Siakam since they traded for him. That's a that's a great point. Not a thing. Yeah, like he's if he's looking at the stats. He's not playing bad, but mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. it's just been crickets. Yeah, and they ended up, um, you know, they kept Miles Turner through all that stuff. He was another one that everybody thought it was going to get traded. So they got Siakam, Turner, and Halliburton. They did um, get rid of Buddy Heald. They got rid of uh, Bruce Brown, so like they're make they're another team that's kind of made some weird decisions. They they signed Bruce Brown in the offseason, they only to trade him. Buddy Heald was on the block for a while. Um, ben Matherin's been pretty good for them for the most part, but he's also really inconsistent. And then um, Aaron Nesmith's the other one 
I haven't looked at how he's been playing. He's been okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they're another one of those teams kind of stuck in the middle, I would say. Um, so that, At least they have a, a emerging superstar. Yeah. They have a guy that they know is the face of a franchise, and mm-hmm. many teams don't have that. Right. So. Yeah, it, it's just, is it all the right fit? Like, do you have the right pieces around him? And that's that's where it starts to get tricky for a lot of teams. Uh, any other teams in the East that you want to bring up? Uh, I want to bring up Miami because they're on a roll right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's getting close, closer to the end of the season. Yeah. And that's usually when they, pun intended, start heating up. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry for the pun. That's okay. But We appreciated it around here. I got to bring up specifically my guy. Out of UCLA. When he was picked, everybody said he was perfect for the Heat culture. Mm-hmm. And man, has he been hooping. Yeah. My guy, Jaime Jaquez. Yep. I think both of us appreciate just overall skill and like footwork and shot making ability in basketball. Mm-hmm. It's one of the like best things to watch. Yeah. When you love the game, somebody that understands like how to get buckets right? and not just like hooping and just randomly just shooting from anywhere, yeah. like picking your spots and knowing how to – watching how my hockey has play as a rookie in this league, is it's, it's beautiful to watch. Mm-hmm. Like what he did against Sacramento, like he was getting in like Kobe positions, yeah. that like mid-post area, and just going to work every single time. Pump fakes, uh, turnaround fadeaways off the glass. Mm-hmm. It, it he he just knows how to work in that area, mm-hmm. and it it's almost like a dying art in in the NBA. Only a few guys still know how to like have that type of game, and seeing a guy at his age know how to play that way, like you can tell how much he studied Kobe, yeah. and probably still does because they're being be, being able to play that way at that age. You have to study those types of players mm-hmm. from that era to know what you're doing, right? And I I just I enjoy watching him play basketball. Mm-hmm. Because of yeah, how much skill he has. Yeah, and I like the fact that like he's one of those guys that he's like he's not the best at anything. I don't think he's just very good in multiple parts of his game, yeah. and he, he just knows how to play right. And he utilizes that to the best of his ability for the team. So yeah, I I appreciate that, and yeah, he's become a really good bench piece for them, uh, which is really nice. Um. The other thing that I want to bring up, too, that I think is always funny because I feel like I always suggest it, is what happened to Duncan Robinson? Well, he's been playing lately again, and he's been he's had a fire lit under him. Again, this no pun intended. This happens pretty much every season since he got his money. Yeah. He disappears, and people say he's not worth it, mm-hmm. and then he has a hot streak, and people say he's back. Right. Well, <laughs> Almost then, every season. But it's like they go through weird ebbs and flows of like not playing him for a while, mm-hmm. and now like he, they're playing him again, and he's had a couple uh, good games. Uh, people are trash talking him, and he's just talking back, which I always think. I is didn't hilarious. realize he's having a like quality season. Yeah, yeah, thirteen, two and three, forty-one percent from three, forty-five from the field, mm-hmm. and eighty-eight from the line. Like, what more do you ask right. of from him? Yeah, and he's that guy that can get hot at any moment and yeah. provide a spark. Especially with right now, they don't have Tyler Hero at the moment. Um. The other sneaky move that they made that people forget about already, which myself included, was that Terry Rozier move. Another guy that can give you a spark. So they got a lot of like sparksters on their team. Like Duncan Robinson can go for 20, 25 uh, if he has a crazy night. Terry Rozier, Rozier can go for 30 at a at a moment. Yeah. Jaime almost went for 30 when they beat Sacramento a few days ago. Yep. And we know Tyler Hero can be that way too. Um, and then they have their steady pieces of Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. So they're they're a team that's that that's always kind of spooky, I would say. Yeah. For sure. All right, let's go to the West real quick. Um the West is still kind of the classic like wild wild west. How about these one and two seeds? <laughs> They've both, been there. Both 41 and 17. But no, nobody could have predicted this to start yeah. the season. And they've been hanging around all season long, Minnesota and OKC. Yeah. To the the younger teams. And OKC okay, so just played a primetime TNT game. Yeah. Which was cool to see. Yeah, they're getting some some highlights. Uh Chet Holmgren has been everything as advertised, I would say. Yeah. Um OKC okay, is gonna be fun for years to come, to be honest. Um 
And then Minnesota, I kept feeling like they should be better even last year, but they never made it through. And then this year they, they finally, I guess, figured it out. Um, they recently extended Mike Conley. Anthony Edwards and Cat are kind of the, the glue pieces to this team, even though Cat was another one that people thought maybe they trade him or something. Um, and Anthony Edwards, again, is just – He's kind of become one of the key guys of the NBA, which is I'm like twofold with it because I like I don't even I don't even think he's there yet. No, he hasn't hit what he could actually become. Yeah. And and part of my thing with him, I like him being somewhat nonchalant and having that like not care attitude. But I want a better balance of it, I guess. Like we talked about the all-star game of how he wanted to just shoot left-handed like yeah that's maybe a little too careless having a little too much fun and then we talk about like the cat game and all that where the whole team was a little all over the place um so i want them to rein it in just a little bit because when they get to into the playoffs like right now you're looking at minnesota could be playing a team either sacramento dallas golden state or the lakers all those could be losses in a seven game series. So now, uh, there's a good chance they win most of them, but yeah, there's I think they're beating the Lakers. I don't know though. Like I, I think they're beating the I Lakers. I hate the Lakers, man. but uh, I just feel like there's that time where The Lakers, I they they just can't be trusted, man. No, they can't. But if 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 the Lakers are gonna play, which they have LeBron and Anthony Davis, a little more veteran players, against a much less experienced team in Minnesota. But when you look at the supporting cast, like Yeah. You you can't you can't trust the Lakers supporting cast. All your points are valid. I'm just It's possible, yes. It's possible. For, for the young team like Minnesota that has shown some of their I don't know, flaws of I can't even think of the word I'm looking for for some reason. Um that they're a little juvenile i guess that i don't know I, one of those teams could maybe upset them and that would feel really bad for minnesota fans um and then we have denver at three which they're just i mean they're denver i, I don't know what else to say about them yeah. i think they'll they'll figure it out for the playoffs anyway um the clipper how do you feel about the clippers because a lot of people are really liking the clippers chances this year and I can never trust a Clippers team. I'm in on the Clippers. Okay. And it's like the sole reason it reflects everything that they are this season. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other situation where James and Russ just are bought in and just making things work. And Ty Lue is making it happen. Yeah. Like James Harden is fully into what this team is and the culture. Mm -hmm. Russell Westbrook is completely into his role as the backup. And playing well in his role, mm -hmm. where else does this happen? Yeah, and like they're they're completely fine with Kawhi and Paul George being the guys. Mm -hmm. They they root and rally for the other guys off the bench. It it's it's all making sense and it's all clicking right now. Yeah, and when they're really going, they're like most teams just can't stop them. Mm -hmm. It's they've been they have something. They become sort of the the land of the misfit toys. Yeah, to be honest, and they're all meshing, mm -hmm. and they're well balanced too. Yeah, and they have some depth pieces um, that they can use, like we said, like Russell Westbrook coming off the bench, but also being able to be a spark in certain games um, is pretty good for them. So, yeah, they're an interesting team. I, I don't know. It's just the Clippers mantra. I think that I just can't, I can't believe in them. Speaking right of now. the Clippers, did you see their new uniforms? Yeah. Those things are nice, mm -hmm. nice and clean. Yeah, the I, that with the new arena, I feel like they they could be turning a corner. Yeah, yeah, I think they're they could be they're right around. Um, the Pelicans, your guys, they're in the fifth seed. <sighs> I know. <laughs> you sound so unhappy about this situation. <laughs> Because yeah, just, uh, tell the people what you're thinking. They're still the same Pelicans, though. Like, it seems like Zion and Ingram still are 
they don't fully mesh. They're not always playing at the same time. Like, there's just weird things about this team that make me nervous. I like that they're playing well, but I just it's hard to trust them, and that sucks because they should be really good. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, they even have depth now. Like, Zion, Brandon Ingram, they got their defender in uh, Herb Jones. Jonas Valanciunas is that veteran guy that's just kind of steady for them. Trey Murphy has been insane at times. CJ McCollum, you know, he's another kind of veteran guy. But then they have, like, Larry Nance and Jordan Hawkins, who's been really good as a rookie. But for some reason, it's not always there, and I... That just makes me nervous. Zion averaging just over five rebounds will always piss me off. Yeah, I I don't. He should be averaging ten rebounds. I don't understand mm-hmm. why he's averaging just like five point six. Yeah, and then like he almost had a triple double against the Bulls, but they lost that game. And I don't know. Like I know they they've been without uh, McCollum for a little bit. He's been injured, but. I don't know. I want to believe in this team, Malik. I really do. But I just, I'm nervous when they get into a seven-game series where they're going to be. Especially because right now they're lined up against, like, the Clippers or something. Which, you know, as much as I just dog the Clippers, that's a good matchup for them. So makes me a little nervous. And then I think the interesting thing about the West, too, is you have a lot of these, well, I guess not a lot, but the first two teams are the young teams. And then this back half is all like old greats. the veteran teams yeah. that have been there before. Phoenix, yes, they're in the sixth seed, but at the end of the day, they have Booker, Beal, and Durant. Sacramento, we saw them last year do it. Um, Dallas has been playing better. Kyrie and Luka have been going crazy a little bit. I always say you can't count out Golden State. They're nine and two in their last eleven. Steph's they been kind of crazy. Something out. Um, Draymond, he's been playing. Has been good. good. Yeah, Clay off the bench, shooting well. Yeah, and then the Lakers. A lot of people say you can't count them out. We're a little different, but count them out <laughs> for the most part. Count them out. <laughs> yeah, the Lakers aren't doing anything in the postseason. Yeah, but so whoever comes out of the playing. Like getting him, getting them into a seventh game series is a little bit spooky for those top seeds. So, yeah, I don't know. I think right now the way it's lined up, having Denver versus Phoenix would be insane. That'd be a fun first round. Um, is there any other Western teams that you wanted to talk about specifically? I can't remember if I did it, but I think I counted the Warriors out. I think I said they were kind of done, mm-hmm. and they instantly like responded after the, after the All Star break. And Steph is doing what he does. You can never doubt him. Yeah. But, yeah, he's playing out of his mind. Kuminga's figuring things out. Uh, Brandon Pajemski, the rookie, he's playing well. Mm-hmm. Chris Paul just came back from injury and hit, like, three threes. So yeah. he was really good off the bench. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis had 17 <laughs> a few games ago. Yeah. Like, that. that's a really valuable second-round pick they made because mm-hmm. he's – He's playing well as their backup big. Right. Yeah, they, I, just, I just like what they're doing right now. Yeah. And, and they yeah. and they even, like, if you look at the, the um, scoreboard, they lost to Denver, which stinks, uh, 119 to 103. But in that game, Steph was 1 of 10 from the three. He had only 20 points. And they were somewhat in the game for the most part. I think it was like the fourth quarter was when, yeah, it was the fourth quarter that Denver just pulled away. But to be in a game where Steph shoots one of 10 against a, the former champion, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Also, I just for a bit of a laugh, I want to bring up the Rockets <laughs> because Jalen Green has regressed in his first three years of the league. Mm-hmm. And it's just funny because of like the stuff he said about Detroit and how he didn't want to be here. Yeah. And he started well. He shot like, almost 40% from three mm-hmm. during his rookie season. Now he's done a 30%. He has a lot of like two or 15, like three of 17. He has yeah. a like 
a lot of tour date stat lines going on. Yeah. He'll score over 20, then he'll score like 11. So just just funny seeing Jalen Green kind of have a down year like this, not play great. Mm-hmm. Alperin Shingun is my guy, so I like him being the best player. So, yeah, shouts out to the Rockets for just being in a weird spot where yeah. their like, most important player, Jalen Green, isn't really figuring it out right now. Yeah. So tough for the Rockets. How do you feel about the opposing bottom teams of the West? The Spurs because, have Wimby, so yeah, and, and is that's what it is. that's the big difference. Like San Antonio feels like they have a future. Portland is one and nine. Portland, I am I, not sure yeah. where they go. Scoot has not. I mean, I think it's going to take him some time, but like I haven't seen many flashes. He's even. he's not what I. Th- he he just started. He's a rookie. Yeah, but I expected a lot more explosion. Right. And, and again, year. like as a rookie, you want to at least see some flashes here and there of what a guy can do. And I just I haven't seen it. And that's yeah. it's a little bit and concerning. DeAndre Ayton is still soft. Uh I would yeah. straight up trade Chauncey uh for for Monty Williams. <laughs> uh, bring Chauncey to Detroit. That'd be fun. Give him a real shot to coach some mm-hmm. young, talented guys that are hungry. Yeah. Cause Ayton barely cares. Get him out of Portland. Please. Yeah. Memphis without Ja, it's just it's tough to watch. Right, like they're they're getting hope out of Gigi Jackson right now. Mm-hmm. Who it's cool to see he's the youngest player in the league. He's having some really good games. Yeah, but they're not winning many games, and they're they're one of the yeah, right. It's just not good. Yep. But then, like we said, meanwhile for the Spurs, yes, they've lost a lot of games, but man, Victor has been everything and more. He doesn't make sense. No. And so. he it, it's getting crazier every game. Yeah, he's getting more and more minutes. He's, he's averaging, getting more confident, too. He's averaging about four blocks a game, 10 points, tw- or 20 points, 10 rebounds. Yeah. yeah he's and his three-point percentage is climbing, too. Yeah, he's going to be a nightmare. He's only going to keep putting on more weight, I think, as years go on. What does his prime look like? I don't know. I when don't, does he hit it? I don't know. When does it end? <laughs> I you just have to start thinking like he's gonna be a Giannis with skill and shooting ability. Is Tim Duncan about to help him every offseason? I don't know. What if he just like starts hitting twelve bank shots a game <laughs> from the post area? I, I have no idea. Uh, it's gonna be oh crazy. My God, yeah. But it's gonna be fun. Unfortunately the Pistons couldn't have gotten him. <sighs> Victor and Jalen Duran, could you imagine? Let's 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 leave that alone, please. <laughs> Anyway, all right, let's move on to college basketball with uh, the last, what do we got, 20 minutes or so? Um, college basketball, more craziness. Um, we're kind of cycling through the top teams. UConn finally dropped back down again uh, after their loss to Creighton, which was surprising. They got beat to the floor uh, by Creighton, and I really thought that game was going to be a blowout the other direction, and it wasn't. So we got Houston back at number one, Purdue at number two, UConn, Tennessee, Marquette, Arizona, Kansas, Iowa State, UNC, and Duke as the top ten. Any team in the top ten that you want to point out, um, and then we'll move on from there. Uh, I'm still a big believer in UConn. Okay. I think at their best, I think them in Houston might be the best when they're at the top of their game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Duke could be scary. Coming into March Madness because mm-hmm. they have certain pieces that just, when they get on rolls, they're almost impossible to stop. Yeah. One of them is mainly Jared McCain, true freshman from California, absolute sharpshooter. Mm-hmm. He scored over 20 multiple times this season. He's been red hot lately. And when he gets going, their offense is close to impossible to stop. Yeah. Now, they did have a tough loss to Wake Forest. Uh, their last game, but they're they're mm-hmm. still really good, and I think it it doesn't take much for them to get on a roll. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think Duke could be a sleeper mm-hmm. in the tournament. Yeah, I want to bring up the team I've been talking about a lot lately is Tennessee, because their last four weeks of the season is a gauntlet, and I think the the way that the SEC is going to round out could be really exciting. Um, Tennessee, they're gonna they're gonna play Auburn tonight. And then their final three games are against Alabama, South Carolina, and then Kentucky. Yeah, so, tough. so the <laughs> finish, tough. so the finish to the SEC, 
is going to be pretty wild. And I still just, two of them are away games. Yeah. Yeah. At Alabama, at South Carolina, mm-hmm. and then Kentucky at home. Right. And I I still believe in Tennessee, but this is going to be a big a big get for them if they can win. Yeah. If they go three and one, I think if they go two and two, they still get a really good seed. I mean, yeah, they're going to. Yeah. Um, and then that also is going to make the SEC tournament even more exciting. Yeah, just, just don't go zero and four. I don't. I can't see that. I don't either. Do but you? listen, I've seen crazier things happen. I mean, I guess if teams, they, like you said, this is. It would be concerning yeah. if they lost to Auburn tonight. I guess I would think. Yeah, it's it's a home game. This is probably an expected win. Mm-hmm. So, so we'll see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, how do you feel about Marquette? Because <laughs> to me, I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not a big believer in Marquette, especially being at five. <sighs> I, I don't think I'm a big believer either. I just don't. Know I like if, them, but yeah. I I just I don't know if they don't have that extra punch. Mm-hmm. Like they have a bunch of really good players. Yeah. Tyler Kolick is a high-level college point guard. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if the Big East is strong enough. I think UConn is really good, but like they're beating up on the other Big East teams, and I don't know if I don't know if they're that good. You know, I understand what you're saying because that's yeah. how I feel about crazy. After too. like the top two, after like the top three of the Big East, it starts getting sketchy. Mm-hmm. It does. Because that's why I thought that Creighton wasn't going to play well against UConn. Because I just, I don't know how I feel about the Big East. Creighton has an extra thing. I think you Marquette doesn't. Yeah, they have two or three guys that can really, they can they can hit like five threes in like five minutes. Yeah, or less than five minutes. I agree. They have that. guys that can absolutely light you up. Mm-hmm. I think Marquette might have like one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. Cam Jones is one of those guys. Yeah. He was he had a big tournament game, didn't he, last year? I think he did the first or second round, but yeah, they they lost to MSU. Yeah, I mean they fizzled out. But anyway, all right. Uh, following the top ten, we got Auburn at eleven, Creighton, Illinois, Alabama, Baylor, Kentucky, St. Mary's, South Carolina, Washington State, San Diego State, and then we got Dayton, who's dropped down again. But then we got a bunch of people back in the top twenty-five: uh, Utah State, Gonzaga. Florida, and then USF. What teams in the back half do you want to point out? Who is Washington State? I what thought, is this team? I thought they were going to be better, um, but they are very confusing. I agree with that. What do you mean you thought they were going to be better? Well, because after they beat Arizona. <laughs> oh, well. And then they go and lose to Arizona State. Well, that's just the ins and outs of college basketball. But what I'm saying, like, I have no idea where this team came from. Yeah. Like they're they're kind of like the West Coast South Carolina to me. Yeah, and like they they have multiple transfers that came in and are just balling. Mm-hmm. Like Isaac Jones, I think he came from, I think like Idaho State or something or Idaho. I'll try to look real quick. Um, Jalen yep. Wells, I think came from Division Two. Yeah, Isaac Jones was uh, Idaho. Yeah, uh, Jalen Wells came from Division Two. He had twenty seven in that Arizona upset, mm-hmm. and he's a high level shooter and scorer. Mm-hmm. Like they they just found these random guys that just <laughs> yeah they're just balling out yeah they put and it together a, a part of it might be because the Pac twelve isn't as strong as it's ever been mm-hmm. but I I don't know they've they've just figured it out yeah and it's really impressive to watch mm-hmm. how do you feel about USF making it into the top twenty five because they're a I'm new happy it's their new time. face it, it's the first time I think I've ever seen them in the top twenty five yeah. But they deserve it. Mm-hmm. They still have one loss in conference. They've been taking care of business every week. Yeah, I mean, fourteen and one in conference, twenty one and five overall, fourteen and two at home, thirteen game win streak. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't know what you say to like put them down in any way. Right. They're the other, they're good. The other thing that I think is important to remember is you know nobody there wasn't that many people that were on FAU last year because. Oh, the American Athletic Conference. whoop de doo yeah. They made a run last year. And I'm not saying USF is that team, but... I mean, they beat FAU. Right. They're the reason why FAU isn't ranked at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just something to watch out for, I guess. Um, 
I don't know. I wouldn't be concerned about St. Mary's or Gonzaga this year. Maybe St. Mary's, but I just I don't. Gonzaga know. Gonzaga has no like standout player this year. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a weird time. Yeah, where it's it's all about like the whole of their parts more than like their superstar players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the West Coast Conference without Gonzaga being dominant is kind of hard to trust. St. Mary's is the best team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. I don't know how to where to put them necessarily. Um, do you want do you want to talk about Kentucky? They are scary when they're at their best. But, man, there are stretches when their defense is so bad. They're a tough team to pin down. Mm -hmm. But when they have stretches like they did last night, well, first of all, they went over Alabama. They put up 117. And all of their five-star, like, freshmen are on fire. Mm -hmm. And they're all just rolling. Games like that, they're unstoppable. But you rarely get those types of games out of Cal, Cal out of Calipari teams, right? Where every single freshman is on point. Mm-hmm. This game against Mississippi State showed me something, because the Bulldogs were in control for a lot of the game, and until like the last three minutes, that's when Kentucky started to gain some ground, and it's because of two guys. Mm-hmm. One of them it was a five star guy that people were excited about. They knew how good of a score he was uh he played in the um what's what's the semi-pro league the high school kids are going to now instead of going to college um <laughs> i forgot what it's called I, I don't take it seriously so it's the sponsored league. is the overtime league ot i think so i think, I think yeah. it's the over, yeah he played in the overtime league rob dillingham He's lived up to every single bit of what people thought he would be. I mean, he's one part like Jamal Crawford. He can score like Malik Monk did at Kentucky. He can put up the big numbers. His handle is crazy. His jumper is smooth. Mm -hmm. He can score in any way on the court. It's a bit chaotic at times. Like, there's no specific thing you can, like, put his game in. But he he, he gives you everything. Yeah. He gives you almost everything. And then the guy that's my personal favorite, the point guard, the point guard that I don't think people expected to be like the lead guy on this team. DJ Wagner was the number one player in the country. Mm-hmm. Son of Dewan Wagner, former uh, guy that played for Calipari. That was at Memphis. Mm-hmm. Uh, top pick in the draft in 2002, I believe. One or two. And... DJ Wagner hasn't been the top build point guard. Yeah. It has been a guy that was a four star guy from Kentucky. His dad played at Kentucky. His mother did too. Reed Shepard. This kid right here, he's he he's reminiscent of like the Steve Nash's, the he he's like a mix of so many different people, but he's also <laughs> just his own guard. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the season, he's on, he's averaging 12, 4, and 4. But that's on 51% three-point shooting. Yeah. 53 from the line and 83 from the free throw line. I mean, 53 from the field mm-hmm. and 83 from the free throw line. Yeah. And he has put together a high-level string of games as the backup, scoring over 20 multiple times. And last night against Mississippi State, he just went off. Mm-hmm. 32 points. Seven rebounds, five assists, four of seven from three, 11 of 14 from the field. And this is while battling another high-level freshman guard from Mississippi State, a kid named Josh Hubbard, who put up 34 himself and hit seven threes. Mm -hmm. A guy people need to pay attention to, Josh Hubbard, remember the name. (laughs) High-level shot maker. But Reed Shepard was in total control Mm -hmm. the entire second half. I mean, hitting like, he can catch and shoot. He can shoot off the dribble. He's a better athlete than you'd expect. He can play defense. Yeah. He play makes. He can pass. He made. He turned the ball over and almost cost him the game in the end. But he came right back and he hit the game winning floater to win the game. Mm-hmm. Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham, I think as long as them two are healthy, it, this Kentucky team is dangerous. Yeah. The tough part, which you know is, has always been a Kentucky thing, those three guys you just mentioned, they're all freshmen. Yeah. So and they've had other freshmen that have 
struggled. Yeah. Like DJ Wagner, mm-hmm. who's yeah, not having not playing as well as Reed Shepard. Right. And Justin Edwards, who was the highest ranked of the bunch, he was top five in the country. He's only averaging eight. Yeah. So any of those teams, like those young teams like that, they can be dangerous in the tournament, but they can also shoot themselves in the foot. So it's just it's something you gotta be be ready for, I guess. But they are they are dangerous. They can score with anybody. The only then the only other problem is that if you get into a defensive matchup, will they struggle? So they'll be a fun one to watch, I would say, going into uh tournament time to see how they play. And again, last game of the season to finish out the SEC, Tennessee versus Kentucky should be pretty pretty electric. All right, last 10, less than 10 minutes. Um, we have to talk about them. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, not the whole conference, but we we're going to we're going to bring up the Big Ten Conference a bit. Um, Michigan State. Michigan State. Sparty, Sparty, Sparty. What have you done? How, what have you become? How long have we been talking about Tom Izzo that he should retire? How long has it been? I think at least two years. At least. At this point. Yeah, at least two People years. People are just now catching up to us. And I don't want to act like the smartest guy in the room, but after their first I'm year, feeling pretty after good. After their first year of double-digit losses, mm-hmm. we started questioning things. Yeah. And it's been three years since? Mm-hmm. That, or two years since that first, yeah. I think, three straight seasons of double-digit losses, I think. Yeah, I'm trying to get it all together, but yeah. Right. And I know, like, We'll get into this these games, but Michigan State just lost back to back games at home, at home against Iowa and Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Not even top tier Big Ten teams. Uh, they only beat Michigan by ten. They only beat Penn State by eight. Yet they beat Illinois a couple weeks ago. Again, a very frustrating team, but. Now, because of the extreme case, especially in this Ohio State game, people have finally realized what we've been talking about with Tom Izzo and some of his stubbornness. He He started started Xavier Booker. Exactly. (laughs) He started Xavier Booker, and down the stretch, he played Matty Sissoko. You you, you didn't even bring up the fact that Xavier Booker was, like, playing well. He was having a good game. Yeah. Um, And because Izzo has this weird trust that I don't fully understand with Nobody Matty understands. Sissoko. Nobody understands. He finished the game, and I don't think he really did a whole lot for them down the stretch. Ohio State, um, they made a miraculous shot to end the game, to win the game. But Michigan State had the lead the last few minutes of the game, and they played bad defense. And they allowed Ohio State to get to the line, make some shots, Ohio State shot 38% from the field, 17% from three. Three of 17. Now, Michigan State was no better. They shot 40% from the field, 26% from three. But the biggest problem with Michigan State right now, and I saw somebody on Twitter, I wish I knew who it was, but they posted stats about Michigan State. They are one of the highest percent three-point shooting teams in the league as far as efficiency. But they are one of the lowest in the country at attempts, which is what I've been saying. Their three-point percentage stats have been inflated for a couple years now. People always talk, oh, well, they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the league. Well, they don't shoot that many threes. The biggest problem that Michigan State has had in these stats, they are one of the worst offensive, I think it was offensive rebounding teams in the league, or defensive, I think it was defensive rebounding. And... They're one of the worst teams at second chance points. These are all like toughness stats and like go get it stats that Michigan State, I feel, has always been known for. That they're just going to work a little bit harder than everybody else. That's that's kind of the Tom Izzo mantra. And they're not doing any of that. They're not hustling for rebounds. They're not They're not getting the hustle points. And that's where Michigan State has always thrived. And I don't know how they turn it around at this point. Like, they're 17-11. and 11, And to finish their season, 
They got Purdue up next. They get to play Purdue <laughs> at yeah. Purdue. You know the last time they beat Purdue at Purdue, Malik? Was it like 2016 or something? I believe, and we'll have to fact check later, <laughs> unfortunately. Valentine or something? I'm pretty sure it was 2014. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, a decade. Oh, man. Listen, I, every memory I have of them playing at Purdue, they always go and get their butts whooped. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, they got them up next. And then they got Northwestern. Who's a better? Yeah. Who's a better team right now? Yep. And then they have Indiana. Who's You can't you can't lose that game. You can't Indiana but is pathetic right now. <laughs> it's at Indiana. It is. Um that's the only saving grace maybe about Northwestern is it's at Michigan State. But um this team could be 17 and 14 to end the season. Tyson Walker better have the game of his life on that senior night. Yeah. He better. And who knows with the Big Ten tournament what's going to happen. I think at this point most people expect them to be almost one and done. (laughs) Yeah. Or maybe get a win and then be out. But there is now a wild chance that I didn't think was possible. They might miss the Big Ten. There's a way they could miss the whole tournament. Especially if they lose to Indiana. Because losing to Purdue, Northwestern, you know, that's kind of accepted. That's kind of fine. But if they lose to Indiana to end the season, that is not going to bode well for them. And then to go into the Big Ten tournament right after that, that's spooky season right there. Especially because you have Iowa right behind them at 17 and 12. Minnesota is right behind them at 17 and 10. Those two teams could get the nod over Michigan State. And what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight teams that have 17 wins. That's right on the cut line of how many Big Ten teams make it into the tournament every year. And if Michigan State falls to that bottom below Iowa and Minnesota because of their schedule, I don't know. I don't know where they'll be. I need to see some bracketology pretty soon here, but the only saving grace they have is they've played enough big name teams throughout the season that can keep them afloat. But are we looking at like a 12 seed Michigan State team or something like that? It could be shaping up like that. Like a last four in, like Yeah. That's wild. It could be a last four in Michigan State team. That is wild to think about. Preseason number four. That's the that's the catch of it all. Preseason number four. One I, of the I highest. Was, I was terrified of what this team was was going to be. One of the highest on paper. ranked recruiting classes they've had in a while. Mixed with a senior class that was supposed that all to be like back. one of the yeah. They all came back to, for this reason, and it is just not worked out and I don't know I think I think people have finally caught up to the fact that Tom Izzo as great of a coach as he's been just might be time help the program out and just move on no ill will not entirely your fault even though I still think there's a good part of it but I don't know All right, we have to wrap up unfortunately um, next week, well, there will only be like one college game left for each team basically at that time next week. Yeah, I think so. MSU's last game is, uh, the sixth, the 10th actually. Oh, the 10th. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, everybody will they have play a lot Indiana of the end of the 10th. Okay. So yeah, everybody's going to have about one more week after. So we'll be able to start doing like some big time previews, um, for conference tournaments and we'll prep for the big dance as well. And we're getting closer to NFL free agency and things. So along with the draft, so we can start doing some NFL talk as well. And then we'll keep updated on any uh, NBA stuff as we get closer to the playoffs. But this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Basketball in the state of Michigan sucks, except for Oakland. Go Golden Grizzlies.